Hello and welcome to the course Introduction to the Psychology of Language. I am Dr. Ark Verma from IIT Kanpur and we are in the third week of the course. This week we are talking about speech production and comprehension. In today's lecture, we will continue talking about aspects of speech production. In the last lecture, if you saw, I discovered in some detail the Weaver++ model of speech production. The Weaver++ model was given by uh, William Levelt. Uh, and uh, in around 1996-97, this was a model which kind of, you know, cows down the entire act of producing speech. Say, for example, starting from uh, thinking of something to say to finally saying it into a set of componential mental processes. And we saw in adequate detail in the last lecture how each of these mental processes create a sort of an, uh, you know, sequence and that sequence kind of uh, becomes uh, really instrumental uh, for us to understand how speech must be produced. So, you have processes like conceptualization, formulation, articulation and within from conceptualization to formulation you have a series of steps, from formulation to articulation you have a series of steps and again uh, those are the steps which basically specify exactly how the system in a very algorithmic sort of manner produces or becomes capable of producing speech. Today, in this lecture, we will basically look at some of the evidences that have been collected over a range of uh, years, uh, over a range of different kinds of paradigms, uh, which kind of uh, support some of that conceptualization of speech production, uh, the way William Levelt has done it, and also say for example, uh, the way some of the other speech production theories have done it. Okay. Our evidences basically uh, will come from three kinds of studies. So, we will basically look at uh, three kinds of uh, phenomenon or three kinds of paradigm from which we will be drawing these evidence. Major uh, source of the evidence basically uh, when you really want to theorize about how speech is produced kind of comes from the place where you kind of ask as to what kind of errors are people making. If you look at a speech output of an individual or of a set of individuals for let us say uh, 1 hour or 10 hours or 100 hours or 100,000 hours, what kind of errors are you most likely to uh, find out? Uh, and uh, basically, what are those errors going to signify? You know, what do you uh, get if you say, for example, error type A versus error type B versus error type C? What are each of these error types telling you about the speech production process? So, that is the process that we will engage in today a little bit and we will try and see where, uh, you know, the source of these errors could be with respect to the levels model of speech production. So, we will do that. Uh, the second is another very interesting phenomena that happens with respect to speech production is the phenomena of the tip of the tongue, okay. You know a lot of times it happens say for example, if I ask you the uh, name of the very famous shop in your city, say for example, you know, could you tell me the city where the best sweets are sold, okay. Or say for example, could you tell me the name of that shop wherein I can find the best clothes or say for example, uh, a particular thing that I tell you, okay, where will I find the charger to this particular kind of mobile phone, something like that. A lot of times obviously, using having good memory, you can tell me, okay, this is the shop, this is the way to get to that shop. However, sometimes in spite of having a good memory, you will probably, uh, you know, you could struggle uh, for telling the exact name of that place. So, you could say, okay, I remember this shop, you know, this shop is located right next to my school. There is this, uh, you know, nice, uh, you know, uh, juice shop over there. There's also a coffee shop. Uh, the shop basically is in blue in color and it has two uh, syllables in its name. You can tell me quite a few things, but you kind of stuck at that moment in time um, uh, with respect to giving me the exact name of the shop that is referred to as the tip of the tongue phenomenon. When you know everything about the concept that you really need to talk about, but somehow the name becomes elusive, you cannot really take the name of that particular concept and tell me. This is also one kind of speech error if you want, if you want to call it so, but this is a different class of phenomenon altogether, but also this could be also diagnostic of how the speech production process really happens. So, we have to talk a little bit about that as well and we have to see what kind of evidence can come from, uh, you know, uh, looking at the tip of the tongue phenomena and to try and correlate that with the speech production model that, uh, you know, Levelt has laid out. Finally, uh, the evidence uh, that we will examine will come from basically picture naming studies and uh, something that is referred to as the picture word interference task. The picture naming studies as I have been saying is basically a very simple task, you know, you are so, shown a bunch of pictures 
and basically you know your task is to uh, you know uh, name those pictures one by one in a particular sequence so that is that is something that you have to do a uh, picture word interference task is you see a picture but there is a word written on that picture and there can be a relationship between the word that is written and the picture that is drawn and on the basis of that relationship between this word and the picture it kind of has an impact on how you name the picture okay or say how you read the word so we'll basically see uh some of these uh, sources of evidence and we'll see how those evidences match up support not support uh, this whole concept of speech production has been specified in the weaver plus plus model so let us let us uh, move ahead let us start talking about speech errors speech errors are a very interesting uh, category of errors mental errors cognitive errors whatever you call it but uh, sigmund freud from psychology Uh, he had very interesting concept of basically looking at where speech errors might be coming from and he believed that speech errors basically are a window to our unconscious mind he he had a theory uh, i don't know if you're aware or you've done a course in psychology but uh, simon freud had a very interesting theory you know he kind of used to think that uh, most of our mental capability or the mind uh, so to speak uh, only a, a very small portion of that is available to us consciously while a very large portion of that uh, mind is basically available to us is uh, rather unconscious and a part of that is subconscious so only the tip of the iceberg is what is available to us while there is a very large iceberg below the level of awareness now uh, he basically believed that speech errors basically are a window to that unconscious that unconscious or that subconscious whatever you call it uh, according to sigmund freud stored a lot of the experiences that we have repressed from our uh, you know living memory a uh, lot of experiences that we probably don't want to talk about a lot of experiences that probably uh, you know uh, uh, reflect a little bit of a guilt a little bit of a hate sort of scenario uh, and you know similar things so he said that when people make speech errors or he believed that when people make speech errors they make speech errors which are diagnostic of what is wrong in their subconscious unconscious mind okay i'm taking a rather uh, stupid example but suppose i have gone uh, to uh, attend the funeral of one of uh, i know people that i know uh, but people that i don't really uh, you know liked very much i i went there and i wanted to say you know um, uh, uh, you know many con- condolences uh, for this and i really want you know my prayers are with you etc etc but because my unconscious had a very negative feeling towards this person i could end up saying many congratulations for this you know something like that and this is what freud meant when he actually said um, that you know these speech errors are a window to your unconscious mind and he believed that speech errors basically reveal our true inner thoughts you know those that we have suppressed in order to basically live uh, peacefully in this you know or coexist peacefully in this kind of society now that is one way and i don't know whether people really believe uh, uh, in this uh, uh, a lot now or not but uh, modern psycho- psycholinguistic theories modern theories of speech production and uh, speech comprehension really basically don't really uh, you know don't really buy into this a little bit uh, you know quite a lot now basically uh, the belief now is that these uh, speech errors Uh, reflect breakdowns in the various components of the speech production process and these components could be exactly as leveled imagined or very different but the idea is that the speech errors should be seen as uh, you know diagnostic of problems in the speech production process and nothing more than that okay so you had an idea you wanted to speak about something etc etc the speech error will kind of fit in right somewhere in this sequence of events and not really necessarily in your unconscious mind or anything whatsoever okay so this is this is a kind of a departure from the initial idea of what speech errors were supposed to mean but how does it really happen so let's look uh, at this a little bit more closely now uh, you could imagine that uh, or you could kind of if you are confronted with the data you will discover that speech errors are not random there are many kinds of speech errors we'll talk about uh, the speech errors are very systematic and they are systematically in that sense they appear systematic in systematic fashion and they are in that sense diagnostic of what process that uh, might be going on in your uh, head uh, in this sequence of steps that are needed for speech production so let's take an example say for example slips of tongue 
okay you know sometimes we uh, we uh, the tongue slips and you kind of say something else as compared to you know what you were intending to say so slips of tongue it has been observed occur in very systematic patterns and those patterns can be related back to aspects of the speech production process so dell for example knows that slips of tongue can be seen as products of the productivity of language you know we create new things all the time a slip is an unintended novelty you wanted to say something else but you said this it is also something that you have created unintentionally but a novel thing that did not probably exist in your speech say somebody coined the word selfie you know, they probably wanted to say something but they coined this new word and this word has now become a very you know it's it's become a very fashionable term and is used a lot okay so word errors might create syntactic novelties morphemic errors create novel words and sound errors create novel but phonologically legal uh, you know combinations of sound so all of this is legal all of this is real uh, but none of this is really true uh, intended thoughts or something like this. it's just a process you have to look at this as a simple process each of these different kinds of errors these slips of tongues will provide information about how the different components of the speech production process are really working and if something breaks down you can kind of analyze the slips of tongue or any of these speech errors to look at where exactly the breakdown really happened okay so for example let's take an example sometimes people substitute one word for another so in, in slips of tongue there is this error called semantic substitution so people sometimes substitute one word for the another when they are speaking say for example if they are placed under a lot of pressure you know time pressure or you are kind of going for an interview you kind of uh, going to uh, you know you are very afraid of talking to this person and uh, you know there is time pressure as well and suppose say for example you are afraid for certain reason you are very nervous or you are you know you are not physically completely all right in in each of these scenarios you can imagine that sometimes you know some kind of substitutions will happen you wanted to say this word but you'll say something different this is called substitution now semantic substitution error say for example you were going to talk about the rat or your or let us say a very simplest example your name you supposed to name the picture of a cat but sometimes you name it as a rat oh this is no 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 cat you know so this how does this error really happen this error is what is referred to as semantic substitution what is semantic substitution it basically is when you replace the target word with a with another word coming from the same semantic category or coming from uh, or being very closely semantically related to the target word either ways this type of semantic substitution error most likely reflects the conceptual preparation or lexical selection component of the speech production process so if you have to guess where the problem might have happened is probably at the level of lexical selection you went on to select the you know lexical concept for cat but mistakenly selected the concept for rat and then you finally just said it the everything else in the process remains error free okay semantic substitutions uh, can be thought of as reflecting uh, conceptual preparations or breakdown in conceptual preparations if say for example an individual has mistakenly focused on the wrong concept somehow some cue something the mind is somewhere else you know the mind wanders sometimes while you're doing important tasks and that's perfectly natural now alternatively also it has been uh, it has been proposed that semantic substitutions can reflect the way non linguistic components are related to each other and how the activation of those concepts is tied to the activation of lemmas now if you remember or say for example i have not talked about in uh, about this concept here in this course but uh, if you kind of uh, i have given a course on uh, knowledge representation where i talk about uh, uh, basically uh, higher cognitive processes or even on memory where i talk about semantic networks theory and there is this very interesting theory which says that you know concepts in the mind are linked to each other you know different concepts are uh, created as nodes and how those concepts are linked to each other is by virtue of relationships so on and so forth okay so what might happen is that two it it might be the case that there are these concepts which are related to each other in some sense and because you were kind of uh, you know going to select one concept by mistake you select a related concept a semantically related concept okay so viewer plus plus uh, says that maybe concepts are stored in the long term memory in networks it's kind of borrowing from the collins and quillen semantic networks model so it believes that concepts are stored in the long term memory 
in networks or collection of concepts as collection of concepts within these networks concepts that have similar meanings will be closer together or connected to one another and concepts that have that that have very dissimilar meanings will be further apart and probably also not even collected connected to each other as a result what happens is when you think of cat activation might be spreading on to other related concepts say for example cat and dog and rat uh, or say for example cat and lion or tiger or you know these are also related and these are also related this is probably by association this is probably by the uh, and also these are also related semantically as well so that's all right in order to select the correct lemma you needed to ignore the related concepts and focus on the target concept okay semantic substitutions basically might be uh, you know seen as uh, reflecting uh, lemma selection errors you wanted to select this particular lemma or the lemma for cat but by mistake you have now selected the lemma for let us say a rat and then you eventually end up speaking rat instead of speaking cat so this is where the semantic substitution error might come up okay so activating the cat concept will have activated the associated concepts rat dog feel uh, you know rat dog uh, lion tiger etc etc uh, and the lemmas associated with them, uh, those concepts will also have been activated. And by mistake, what really happens is you select the incorrect concept and the incorrect lemma therewith. When it comes, so this is exactly what's happening. When it comes for the time of uh, for the speaker to choose a lemma for further processing, the speaker will choose the target lemma most of the time. But every once in a while, in hurry in nervousness in some kind of pressure time pressure whatever the speaker might mistakenly pick the alternative lemmas for the rat or the dog and you might end up speaking that these kind of behaviors are classified as classical speech errors or slips of the tongue because people clearly did not use the commonly associated term with that picture even though uh, if you ask them, they know the correct word. It's not because they don't know the picture or it's not because that they intended to use something else. It's just because by mistake in that entire process, something got mixed up and the output came out as wrong. That's, that's basically it. Now, other kind of kinds of terms may reflect breakdowns in components of the speech production system. Uh, this was from conceptual parts, so lexical concept, etc, etc. Uh, moving down, some kind of words that you might create as you might utter as parts of your speech error might be diagnostic of other kinds of processes breaking down. Let us look at, at some of that example. So, there is a kind of error that we do which is called the sound exchange error. Now, what is a sound exchange error? Suppose, say for example, you, you have to say fig beat and you suddenly, uh, you have to say big feet, sorry, and you, in, you end up saying fig beat. Now, what has happened here? Big feet, fig beat. What have you done? You've kind of exchanged the first phoneme of the first syllable a little bit. Okay, so fig and beat, beach, bur should have been here, fur should have been there, and that would have been the correct utterance. But what you have done is you've created a sound exchange. Both syllables, the first phonemes have gotten exchanged. This is probably the error uh, at a point where you have, where you are is going to be coming up with the phonological word, maybe somewhere there, maybe at the syllabification place. Let us look at uh, this a little bit more closely. Three, these kind, you know, there have been kind of experiments that have these kind of errors uh, can be elicited in the lab by putting experimental subjects under time pressure. So you usually in our labs, you call participants, we ask them to do particular tasks, and they do those tasks. We measure the dependent variables of time, uh, of reaction time and accuracy. That's what we do. Uh, for these kind of errors, if you kind, if you want to elicit these kind of errors, you can get the participants to your lab. Uh, you can give them tasks. Say, for example, you can give them to name these 40 pictures in two minutes or name these 60 pictures in three minutes, something like that. You give them a very highly time pressure task and the pictures are coming and going for 100 milliseconds, 200 milliseconds, very little time for work to, you know, for you to work with. So how, how is the participant going to do? Obviously the participant is going to make some errors. Sometimes the errors could be of semantic kind, sometimes the errors could be basically sound exchanges. You would know that, okay, this is the space this is the place where this uh, you know error has happened so for example let's take a, a study example which Traxler has taken so let's say uh, you know subjects might be asked to say bid make bad mug big men and similar things like that wherein the first syllable uh, is usually b or let us say first phoneme in the first syllable is b 
and then what you do is you make them practice with this and then you change the pattern and you ask them to say something else you ask them to say say for example mad mad back mad work mad tech something something like that now what has happened is initially the first uh, phoneme of the first syllable was ba now the first phoneme of the first syllable is ma and if you are kind of uh, doing these tasks one after the other and there is a lot of time pressure uh, involved sometimes the participants probably as little as 10% of the time participants might make an error by creating novelties like bad mac or bad bag or mad bag or something like that okay this is where the sound exchange is really happening so sound exchange errors also something to look at with respect to the sound exchange errors is that uh, the sound exchange errors almost always occur when sounds are exchanged between words in the same phrase usually you will not sound exchange the word first word from here and the first word from a sentence that you are going to speak 2 minutes after usually the exchange will happen in the same phrase so big feet big beat in the same phrase okay and the vast majority involve movement of only one single phoneme from each word okay so only one sound will move from here to there and one sound is moving from here to there also you will see another very important aspect is that most of the most of the time these sound exchanges they uh, sort of obey what is referred to as the positional constraint what is the positional constraint sound from the first syllable of this uh, word goes and replaces the sound from the first syllable of the another word okay so basically two phonemes both were them in the first position in the first syllable they get exchanged so big feet b and f were both first syllables were both the first one sorry this is also shown in dell's uh, you know uh, 1986's production model and it says that the positional constraint reflects the way individual phonemes are activated and inserted into frames remember uh, we were talking about how do you come up with the phonological word form what was happening you activate these sounds you uh, organize these sounds into syllable sized frames and you kind of also decided the order there you remember in a strict left to right fashion so you kind of create a syllable sized frame this is the first syllable this is the second syllable this is the first sound of the first syllable second sound of the first syllable first sound of the second syllable uh, second sound of the second syllable now you have a scenario where there are two first sounds of both these syllables two second sounds of both these syllables what can happen here both of them has the first tag both of them have the second tag according to dell's model a number of frames can you know can be activated at the same time so when one is planning for big feet one activates two syllable frames big feet and one activates the phonemes to be inserted in these frames so b g uh, f t both are activated each of these phonemes is marked with an order tag so this is as i was saying this is the first syllable of the first first phoneme of the first syllable second phoneme of the first syllable first phoneme of the second syllable second phoneme of the second syllable. you you give them order tags now because two syllable frames are activated simultaneously and the two phonemes that have the first order tags are uh, also activated simultaneously sometimes what would happen is the production system mistakenly confuses the two and puts this one here and this one there big feet becomes fig beat normally uh, the activation levels of the two first phonemes usually differs a little bit so you will not really make this error i mean the uh, percentage or the distribution of this error would probably be much less but sometimes it could be because of something else because your mind wandered because you were too nervous or too excited you kind of mixed these two and created that kind of error most errors obviously as i said respect the positional constraint because the production system will not jam a phoneme with the first tag to a phoneme with the second tag so that's also because why the positional constraint thing is kind of getting obeyed now this is this kind of so we've talked about semantic substitution we've talked about sound exchange what is the third kind of exchange third kind of exchange could be when you kind of replace the entire word so you could do something what is referred to as the word exchange error what is a word exchange error suppose you were to say my girlfriend plays a piano and you mistakenly said my piano plays the girlfriend you know that's that's ex that's a entire word exchange happening now the majority of word exchanges it has been seen basically you know obey what is referred to as the category constraint what is a category constraint if you have to so to speak if you will ever by mistake unintendedly 
exchange two words from the same kind of in the same sentence and the same phrase you will exchange words from the same category so noun replaces a noun verb replaces a ver verb adjective replaces an adjective so on and so forth now according to the frame and slot models you know these models which say that you create frames and then you kind of put in uh, fill in stuff here according to the frame and slot models garrett 1975 mckay uh, speech involves a degree of advanced planning so you do plan a couple of sentences at least in advance rather than planning a word at a time and so when you plan in advance you, what you do is you lay out a frame for an entire clause or an entire sentence as you're looking for a particular set of words and the precise forms that you need to produce so you kind of you had this message you had this sentence you've kind of created a frame and activated it all right so this frame would consist for of a set of slots and each slot will be labeled for the kind of word that appears so you have say for example you remember subject object verb kind of thing so uh, determiner noun verb determiner noun something like that you have this so first slot may determiner aayega second may noun aayega uh, third may fir se article ya kuch aa jayega fourth mein tumhara fir se noun ya verb aayega so you kind of create this entire slot and you've labeled each of these slots as to what kind of word is going to come here now word exchange errors also happen when more than one candidate is activated simultaneously more than one candidate has the same tag so obviously if you have activated the entire sentence and the entire sentence can have an uh, you know a couple of nouns three four nouns and uh, you know the tag is also matching so noun tag noun tag is a chance of replacement happening okay this is typically how they explain the word exchange errors so word exchange errors might happen when more than one candidate is activated simultaneously also when more than one candidate has the same tag and the production system by mistake assigns the wrong candidate to an open slot or to a wrong position something like that all right so uh, this is about speech errors we've talked about three kinds of errors we've talked about uh, sound exchanges semantic substitutions and lastly word exchange errors let us move to the other uh, body of evidence the tip of the tongue the tip of the tongue phenomena a tip of the tongue uh, is basically as i was telling as i was telling you earlier basically it happens when you are trying to re retrieve a word and you have a strong a subjective impression of the word that you know the word and you kind of can tell details about it but you're temporarily unable to uh, consciously recall and pronounce the word so that's where a word uh, you know a tip of the tongue phenomena will come in according to contemporary production theories del or levelt uh, tod states occur uh, when you have access the correct lemma but you are unable to fully activate the phonological part so you know the lemma you know so as i was saying you can tell us a number of details about that concept but probably not you know be able to generate the sound codes for that particular concept you know are that movie i wanted to see this actor was there he's acted in these this this movies he his hair is like this his height is like this he looks like this he talks like this but i don't remember the name of the actor that is where the tip of the tongue is happening you have the entire conceptual knowledge there uh, but you what you don't have is the phonological form basically to back this knowledge now tip of the tongue experiences uh, are taken as evidence for the distinction between semantic activation and phonological activation that's a very interesting uh, point uh, to be noted here uh, this kind of error tells us that semantic activation the uh, point till uh, lemma selection and afterwards are probably two different parts altogether so all of this is is one all of this is another okay but then why tot experiences uh, you know why should we view tot experiences as evidence for the temporary failure of phonological experiences so let us say why should we take tot as an evidence for the failure of phonological activation let us look into more detail now a more basic a more basic account if you look uh, a bit more deeply to the tot phenomena is uh, you basically you'll first need to understand how uh, tot is studied so sometimes what happens is uh, researchers uh, will ask people to carry around a diary and record all kinds of tots that happen with them this uh, was what i was planning to recall this is how uh, you know the question came this is how i could not do it and i took so much time in coming back with this word something like that okay so these kind of studies basically will indicate that people experience tot is about once or twice a week with the frequency of the tot experiences increasing as people get older as your memory starts failing you you'll probably have more tot experiences as compared to when you're much younger okay another way to induce tot experiences is to provide people with definitions of rare but familiar words 
okay so you can kind of elicit something like that so, so you know the device that is used to uh, take a picture of uh, you know of a very small uh, organism so i'm talking about a microscope or something so but again the frequency of microscope is uh, is much lower so uh, you will take some time to activate that you know so i i can kind of try and elicit the tot phenomena this way now this method the method that i was saying you define these rare experiences in elicit sort of a tot in people now this method uh, of measuring tot experiences is called prospecting so by asking about detailed aspects of the experience researchers can figure out how much information do you really know about the target word okay for example can they think of any sounds that make up the word how many syllables what other information about that particular concept is available to you now uh, if you look at that uh, tot experiences do not really reflect failures of semantic activation so people will usually be able to tell you if you ask semantic questions about the concept okay so mostly people are, who are experiencing tot are able to predict accurately how likely is it that they will be able to name the word in some time so they they know they are reasonably sure that i know this word it's just not coming to me right away let us finish our coffee and while we are walking back i will tell you about that and in the in the back of their head they are kind of you know working very hard to remember that if the correct meaning were not activated much of the time during the tot experience you know how would people be able to be predict that they will be able to tell as the meaning in that little time so that aspect is there further can people activate any phonological information at all during a tot episode uh, let us check do do they activate any phonological information at all or nothing let's see evidence suggests that they do people who are experiencing a tot uh, state are likely to report at least the correct number of syllables uh, in the uh, temporarily unactivated word they are also likely to report the first phoneme in the word if you really probe them you know per se start hota hai naam you know i, I remember co completely uh, it has two words it has these many syllables i remember the the name starts with p uh, with p or per uh, but i don't remember it so people have that kind of information available as well okay they can sometimes come up with similar words bad bad hat something but exactly i don't really remember now moving further people experiencing tip of the tongue are more likely to accurately report the first and the last letters as well so not only the first one the spelling is also available the likelihood uh, of the so suggesting that substantial information about the overall word form as well as its component sounds are activated during the tot experience so it kind of says that not only semantic but a lot of phonological information is available as well uh, to the person who is experiencing the tot state okay so the likelihood of a tot experience may then reflect the strength of the relationship between the conceptual the lemma and the phonological levels of representation okay where is it that this thing is broken okay words that we encounter infrequently are more likely to produce tot experiences than words that we are encountering frequently so if this link between these three concepts are very strong and very much there and you have been saying this again and again practicing uh, this by talking about the concept in different conversations then it is less likely that you will experience a tot state but say for example conceptually you know that but you've not said that word or talked about that topic to somebody you know suppose say for example you are a big fan of say harry potter movies and there there is not really a harry potter movie that has come out uh, Uh, very recently and people probably would have seen that some time back but suppose the conversation kind of uh, goes towards that side uh, you know it conceptually uh, but the link between the conceptual and the lemma or the conceptual and the phonological part is kind of slightly weak so you take a little bit of a time in coming back with that word that is probably what the tot experience you know denotes for us so that was that we talked about speech errors we talked a little bit about the tot phenomena let us move to this other class of evidences that we were talking about the picture naming task and the picture word interference task let us look that, look at that a little bit more now the picture naming studies uh, as i have been saying they provide evidence about speech production because they offer a window into a very basic concept of speech what is this very basic aspect of speech how do we find the words needed to express a concept when i are showing me a picture of a banana an apple or an orange how do i uh, from this picture move to the sound for orange or how do i from this picture move to the sound of the banana how am i making this link possible okay 
and how do I once I've accessed that sound how do I activate the sound that makes up that word something like that okay so these are some of the questions that you know we'll talk about in this section so early studies in picture recognition and picture naming have shown that people activate different concepts about at about the same speed but concepts that were used less frequently in speech or in writing took longer response times. Obviously, uh, things that have, you have been coming across in your daily life frequently will be easier to activate as compared to things that you've kind of rarely come across. Okay, that's, that's intuitively understood. Now, in these experiments, the picture naming experiments that is, participants look at pictures and perform one of the two tasks. In one task, they simply stated whether they had seen the objects before. So tell me whether you've seen this picture earlier or not. Just a sort of a you know familiarity check, recognition check. In another task, they have to name the picture. So not only tell me this or now you just name it as well. Now they found very small differences in the amount of time it took people to recognize less familiar versus more familiar objects. But they found larger differences when they were asked to name uh, less familiar as compared to more familiar objects. So they found that there were uh, big naming, uh, you know, big uh, naming time differences uh, when you are asking to compare these two things, okay, less familiar versus uh, more familiar objects. Because you don't have so much practice with creating the sounds. You, you remember I was talking about the phone and uh, the uh, frequency inheritance effect, you know, the but example. So because you need to have that practice with creating those sounds again and again as well. Now, uh, because of the amount of time it takes for people to plan a spoken response, it uh, appears to be affected somehow uh, by how often they produce uh, the collection of sounds that labels the concept, less often by how they think about this. You might know about particular things, but you've, you don't, you've lost practice in speaking that out. So that is kind of where this time is coming up. Okay, moving to uh, another uh, research, additional research basically Additional research addresses how concepts are organized and how they are uh, related to one another in long term memory. Uh, the way concepts are organized can affect how easy or difficult it is to retrieve those specific concepts that are needed in a particular situation. So what do you do? So there are two questions. Do you activate just the concept you need or you also activate the related concepts? Do you need to sift through a set of related concepts before you select the ones you need? So both of the questions can be asked. Now, picture naming research suggests that concepts do compete with each other for selection during the process of speech production. So, when you are kind of going to name the picture of a cat, you might also be competing with the names of the rat and the dog and the tiger and the leopard and so on. Okay. In experiments that use the picture word interference task, this is what is kind of tapped. Okay. So, what happens is participants look at the pictures and pictures have these words printed on top of them and they have to name the picture aloud. All right, but experimenters can very cleverly manipulate the relationship between the picture and the word on top of it. And on the basis of this relationship manipulation, they can kind of see some of the interesting effects that kind of come up in naming. You know, there can be a few conditions. Say, for example, picture of a cat with the word cat written on it. So this is identity condition, very fast, not a problem. Semantically related condition. Picture of a cat and a rat. Picture of a cat and a lion. Semantically, if semantically matching is there or semantically non-matching is there, you will see difference in naming times. Phonological condition. Picture of a cat and phonologically similar words. Say, for example, uh, hat or something like that. You know, which is phonologically similar, maybe semantically not really very similar. You will see, you'll see a different effect happening here. So. Again, as I was saying, if the picture of another example, if the picture of a house were there, the word might be mouse in the phonological condition, the word might be home in the semantically related condition. Both, both can be possible. Now, the question these kind of studies are attempting to answer is that how is the representation of a potentially competing stimulus going to affect the, uh, you know, access to and production of the picture name? How does this word interfere or facilitate naming of the picture? That's basically the question. Now, as I said, in the semantic condition, you could see interferences. What is the semantic condition? It has been found that people are slower to name pictures when the overlapping word has a semantically, uh, you know, is semantically associated or has a meaning similar to that of the object in the picture. So, if it's semantically similar, you get slowed down because you're kind of the competition is too much. 
from the conceptualizing phase both words probably are uh, receiving adequate input and the combination is rather high to handle. However, when the overlapping word has a similar sounding name the people uh, sim similar sounding name to the picture people have been found to name the picture faster. So, there could be facilitation the sound so there is no competition on the semantic level but while they were kind of coming up with a phonological word both of them kind of coincide and uh, you know you sort of double the uh, double the amount of uh, activation needed for the sounds and then you kind of do it a little bit faster. So, semantic condition a little bit of interference phonological condition a little bit of facilitation is seen. Finally, because the semantic relationship between the word and the picture produces one kind of pattern uh, while the phonological uh, relationship between the word and the picture produces another kind of pattern it can be observed that picture word interference it can be observed that there is a distinction between the conceptual and semantic activation processes versus the phonological activation processes in picture naming or speech production so to speak. Remember we kind of uh, saw this that this was happening in the uh, semantic substitution errors also. So, you see at least from two uh, places you are coming up with evidences that say that semantic part of picture naming versus phonological part of picture naming or speech production more generally are kind of happening at different places are kind of sort of different sets of processes together. So, in that these two processes seem to be controlled that is the conclusion seem to be controlled by semi independent processors ok. I think that should be it for today's lecture we have talked about the three kinds of evidences and we have talked a little bit about how these evidences can tell us about how the speech production process is really panning out. Thank you so much. Thank you.